Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where in the world you are. Um, welcome to um, this week's uh, Material Digital Humanities Seminar. Um, I'm delighted this week to be um, welcoming a very old friend, um, Sean Graham, um, Professor of Digital Humanities at Carleton University. I've known Sean for 26 years, we just decided. Um, and um, he's, uh, he's, he's been been over the years doing lots of very, very exciting work at the, the intersection of archaeology and digital humanities. Um, the, um, the topic he's talking about today is at uh, uh, an intersection that I hadn't expected even him to, to, to be talking to us about, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, and so um, Sean is going to talk for about 45 minutes, I think, and there will be plenty of time for discussion afterwards on the topic of archaeology in space. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Gabby. It's it's really nice to to be able to chat with you about this and uh, everyone who's who's made time in uh, I assume your afternoon. It's still the morning here in Ottawa. It's a a balmy minus thirteen, and welcome to my basement. Um, being able to talk about space archaeology kind of fulfills um, twelve year old Sean's fondest ambitions. Uh, I, I can I have a distinct memory uh, of being in grade school being quite small, having to do that standard, what is it do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be an astronaut. Um, Canada not having many astronauts in those days. And the teacher asking me, well, what, what's your backup in case everything doesn't really work out? And so with, uh, you know, without much regard to the economic realities of the situation, I said, archaeologist. Um, there's not much call for Roman archaeologists in Eastern Canada. And so I'm now a professor of digital humanities at Carleton, but I had a really weird journey to get here through Roman archaeology and through a, a prolonged period of being underemployed, um, rather unemployable, and uh, there not being much call for stamped Roman brick experts in Eastern Canada um, these days or those days. So during what I tend to think of as the, the wasteland years, I, I spent a lot of time futzing with other people online um, because being a, a white bald guy on the internet means that you can screw up a lot and get away with it. And it was how I pretended to myself that I was still an archeologist. Uh, so by doing all this kind of thing, um, I was able to, to, well, hit just the perfect confluence of events. And it turns out there's a career in being the guy that breaks things, uh, figures out how things work, thinks through what it means to, um, to, to encounter digital fails and, and how that actually can be a useful thing uh, in terms of, I'm in a history department now, so history, public history, archaeology, uh, humanistic work more generally. So it's that perspective that I'm bringing to, to space archaeology. So I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. There we go. You all should be seeing uh, my archaeology. So you can follow along at home or you can take a look at this later as suits you, seangram.github.io slash talks slash space. I actually have two monitors back to back with my notes behind. So if you see me staring way up here, it's because um, my eyesight is failing and I'm trying to read my notes. So archaeology in space. So when Gabby asked me, what is it that I could be talking about today? Uh, I thought, why not? Archaeology in space, because I had actually, when we first started talking about this seminar, had become involved in an actual, honest to goodness, space archaeology project. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about how I, I got into that. But, uh, but first, um, archaeology in space, obvious sci-fi ramifications here, yeah? So... We have a space archaeologist, Jean Louis. We have another space archaeologist, um, Vash. Uh, I, I don't remember what the character's first name was. And archaeology always turns up in science fiction, right? Because 
really the best science fiction isn't about the technology. It's about, it's about what makes us human. It's about meaning from relationships. Science fiction gets that. Um, so here we have, we have Picard, who's a morally upright digital space archaeologist. And we have Vash, who is a um, dubious space archaeologist. And isn't it interesting how Star Trek always casts a woman in that role? But that's, that's a discussion for another day. So there are such things as real space archaeologists. And I am totally indebted here to the work of Professor Alice Gorman from Flinders in Australia and just Dr. Justin Walsh at Chapman University, who, who reached out to me to, to say, would I be interested in being a part of some of the stuff they're doing? These are real space archaeologists. And the link at the bottom of the screen brings you to a bibliography that Alice has put together of a really comprehensive list of works in space archaeology going back to the 90s. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing, fascinating stuff. It, you know, speaking of the 90s, um, we know the work of Rathje, William Rathje, the garbage archaeologist. He actually has a piece in the 90s called Space Garbage. Um, which is kind of cool. So there's, you know, those 26 years that Gabby and I have known each other, there's been space archaeology for, for at least that long. But right now, I'd say Alice and Justin are the people whose work you ought to be, be following if you're, you're interested in what's going on in this. It's also worth pointing out who are not space archaeologists. So, um, Press this button. Q he is a member of the continuum in Star Trek. He dresses like a space archaeologist. He partners with Vash and does weird things. He is not a space archaeologist. The Paclids are similarly not space archaeologists. They, they accumulate archaeological debris in space and repurpose it and use it, but they don't really think about what it means and why it matters. And then there's this clown. Uh, who is what you might call space archaeology adjacent. So I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to get things wrong. Um, but this is like my third or fourth kick at the can at trying to, to explore new um, areas that are, are not familiar to me. And you all get the uh, experience of hearing me speak about space archaeology the for, for the first time ever. You know, this is a be a thing to tell your grandchildren about or not. I'm assuming you're all laughing at this point because otherwise I would be greatly disappointed. So uh, I'm going to tell you about how I became adjacent uh, in the hopes of someday being able to put on my business card, space archaeologist, and, and fulfill that dream of uh, little wee Sean. And I'm also going to talk about how this is actually changing some of the ways that I think about archaeology and digital work more generally. And, you know, why it's, I think, important enough that I'm talking to you here today about it. So this is the plan. Um, a, a little bit of a tour, a little bit of a, a, a wee circling around of where you might encounter space archaeology. Uh, some thoughts on gravity as the weak archaeological force. Um, I'll shift into talking about uh, Gorman and Walsh's uh, International Space Station Archaeology Project and how I got mixed up in it. And my little contribution to that project uh, of trying to figure out how, okay, how do you actually record this stuff? And if if all goes according to, to plan, maybe a bit on what comes next and, and, and your thoughts on, on what I've talked about, because Lord knows there are far better archaeologists out there in the world than me. So, space archaeology, right? So we can, we can think about um, humanity's engagement with space as starting with Sputnik in 57, or we can push it all, all the way back to, you know, the, the astronomical work of, of, of ancient Mesopotamia 
uh, you can draw the boundaries pretty much wherever you like. Uh, in the photograph here, we have um, Robert Godard preparing for launching a, a test rocket in 1935 in Roswell, New Mexico. Um, a shot from a newsreel of the, the first of launching Sputnik. Um, Gorman uh, hit this button here and see uh, what happens. So the space archaeology can be the material culture floating around up there right now. It can be the uh, material culture lying around down here that enabled us to get up there. And so we can draw it, you know, primarily through Cold War material culture. But, you know, if we're feeling generous, we can push it all the way back to, to all sorts of other human engagements with, um, with the cosmos. It really isn't about remote sensing. That's still terrestrial archaeology, but maybe with a really high viewpoint. And with a nod to Dan Hicks, who, who writes about in his book, The Brutish Museums, about um, archaeology really being about duration. Um, it can be about the investigation of human duration as it relates to the cosmos. So Alice Gorman, she argues that, you know, we should be thinking about space archaeology, uh, not just in the context of the Cold War, but also in a, in a kind of cultural heritage landscape. So she, she's drawing on her previous experience of being um, a cultural resource management, commercial archaeology, um, professional working in Australia, uh, especially in terms of the cultural landscapes of Aboriginal peoples. So she draws our attention to the, the World Heritage Convention and from 1998, uh, drawing out aspects of what a cultural landscape entails. So designed or intentionally created landscapes or organically evolving landscapes resulting from human action in the natural environment and the associative cultural landscape with religious, artistic or cultural associations rather than just the material culture alone. So she says by, by framing space archaeology in this sense, you get this three-tiered vertical landscape where you have these designed space landscapes on Earth from launch facilities and tracking stations and, and, and research institutes or ancient temples, for that matter, uh, to organic landscapes in orbit and on the celestial bodies, right? So, so lander debris on Mars, um, uh, satellites, and so on, and beyond the solar system, right? So human, human impact uh, smears across the solar system. And beyond the solar system, Voyager is, is out there, Pioneer is out there too. So this also is like a, a huge reconceptualization of archaeological scales of action as well. So some other sites of, you know, that, that built environment. So P, P, I, forgive me, I can't even begin to pronounce um, the German, but this is the site on the north coast of Germany, on you know, Little Island in the Baltic, where the, the V2 rocket development happens, um, using of slave labor to, to do this. Werner von Braun, who gets uh, picked up by the Americans in Operation Paperclip and is the principal architect of the Saturn V rocket that sends um, sends Neil Armstrong and company up to the moon. Um, it's now a site of space tourism. There are things you can go and see there. There are other aspects of this as well. Um, there's a huge colonial, colonialism is a, is a huge issue in here as well, right? It's the sites of space archaeology um, to develop rocket technology. Well, I mean, they're, they're implicated in the Holocaust. They're implicated in the um, displacement of indigenous peoples from their traditional homelands in Australia. Where uh, the, the the political cartoon is about the the Woomera um, protests when Australia and the United States and Britain are, are creating the rocket test range and the listening radio radio listening posts 
in the outback, which is not an empty space. It's a, a space rich in meaning and significance. Um, you know, and there, there's a, a continuing um, current colonialism in the commercialization of space and the desire to to mine the moon and, and to enrich um, certain corporations here on Earth. I, I have a colleague here at Carleton who is working on uh, robotic devices that could go to an asteroid and, and mine the materials on an asteroid in order to replicate itself to, to continue space exploration in, in that way. And, you know, maybe, okay, for an asteroid, that's one thing, but the moon, the moon is of huge cultural heritage significance to, to such a huge variety of uh, people. It is the ultimate cultural heritage landscape, uh, I would think. So, you know, Gorman is talking about space being a cultural landscape because it, you know, it illustrates a phase in human history from emerging from particular social, economic, cultural, political forces. And all of these landscapes, whether here on Earth or on other bodies, um, are hugely important and have to be we have to be considered, right? We can't just let companies be going up and despoiling. You know, we 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 screwed up our own planet. Um, see if we can maybe be smart this next time. So, um, thinking about all this stuff and reading Alice's work prompted me to say, well, what's the space archaeology of Canada? Um, People don't often think of Canada. Uh, if they do think of Canada, they, they're not thinking about it in terms of space, but we have been in space um, than the United Kingdom, for that matter. The Alouette One uh, satellite up there, uh, just a second, my notes have gone somewhere else. Whoops, wrong button. Please do not adjust your set. I'll get there eventually, folks. I'm trying to run two computers at once. It's not shit. I keep pressing the wrong button. I will get there. There we go. Okay, so my other computer here. Don't try and do this, folks. This is daft. Anyways, the Alouette is that thing in the bottom right hand corner. This launched in 1962. Uh, it was Canada's first stab at the at space. You know, Sputnik was up in 57, so not that long after. You know, it's expected to stay in orbit for another another thousand years. Um, that's amazing. And incidentally, when it went up, only a few months previous, the Americans were doing a atmospheric nuclear testing, setting off bombs in the atmosphere. So it's quite probable that Alouette suffered radiation damage from those tests shortly after it went up. Um, you know, space archaeology and Cold War are hugely intertwined. The, the blue picture, the rocket going up, that's from the Churchill Rocket Range. Churchill, Manitoba is on the shores of Hudson's Bay. It um, was a, a rocket sounding launch pad for about 20 years. I knew about Churchill. Um, I did not know about Resolute. So in the map inset here in the, the bottom left, Resolute is on, um, it's in Canada's high Arctic. The, it too had a rocket launching range. Um, incidentally, uh, Google Earth also reports there's some Thule culture archeological. There's this huge, you know, continuity of human exploration there. In Canada's high Arctic, as part of its response to the Cold War, the traditionally nomadic Inuit were forced to settle in, in towns that to better control, but also to better establish Canada's claim over the North. And you have these rocket launch sites, you have radar listening posts for over the pole ICBM launches, you have listening posts for satellites. So there's this whole landscape uh, happening across the North. 
The, the other photo is the construction of a radar facility in um, Prince Albert, which is in Saskatchewan, but which gives a, a good view for tracking things being launched from uh, Churchill. So there's a lot of stuff going on in terms of on Earth space, archeo space archaeology sites. Um, but it's also, you know, way out there, right? So the scale of space archaeology is not just here on Earth. It includes Voyager and Pioneer out beyond the solar system. It includes those radio waves that have been emanating outwards from Earth since the invention of the radio, the early tele uh, television broadcasts that's still out there. Archaeoenergy, Peter Campbell calls it. And that's, that's kind of neat to think about, electromagnetic waves as being archaeological materials. Um, close to Earth, we also have this cloud around us now of space junk, right? Uh, all the these dead satellites and launchers and, and bits and pieces of rockets are threatening to close access to Earth orbit. Not all of those pieces might be culturally significant, but some things are. The International Space Station, for instance, uh, the longest human habitation in space, Sometimes when we're when you read this material that you come across the idea of a, a, a museum or the idea that maybe we could push these things that are still up there that are of cultural significance uh, into a safer orbit where they where it won't degrade where they won't uh, plummet back to Earth. Uh, interestingly enough, in season three of Picard, such a thing might turn out to be a plot point if I'm parsing the end credits of that show uh, correctly. So no spoilers, but watch, watch an episode, watch the end credits. I think museum orbit might be important. Anyway, the point is human actions are smeared over millions of miles now. The scale of space archeology span means that, well, space time and gravity are actually serious concerns that we have to start factoring into our archeological thinking. And I am no mathematician, I am no physicist, but we'll give that a try. So an archeological site doesn't move around much, right? It doesn't reconfigure itself. Um, everything's at rest. Well, that, that only might work if we're thinking about Cartesian space, X and Y, and maybe Z a little bit. But Cartesian space is only locally relevant, right? Einstein tells us that absolute rest doesn't exist. There's only relative motion and relative velocities that have meaning. So, placed by absolute motion, which is the speed of light, which always has the same value irrespective of your frame of reference. So this three-dimensional space that we are used to dealing with in archaeology, and we have methods that work pretty well for generating meaning from that three-dimensional space, becomes four-dimensional space-time. And the curvature of space-time is what gives us gravity. So the, on the left here, this image, this, the classic uh, gravity well image where, I'm, where a mass like a planet deforms a grid so that all of the, the lines or geodesic curves curve down towards it. Um, and this is where my, my brain starts hurting a lot because physics was never my strong suit. But you think of this as a manifold um, with many folds and curves, but at a small scale, it always appears locally flat. So at small scales, our X, Y, Z, that works fine. Okay, so we've got all this stuff up in space. Um, and as time passes and things are moving over this manifold, they tend to move towards a subset of this space called an attractor. And depending on the amount of energy in the system, um, towards stable or unstable equilibrium. And so I'm following Alice here, Alice Gorman, because she knows what she's talking about and I am merely a neophyte. But 
some of these these attractors in space, the Lagrange points, are unstable. And if something attracts into them, it just keeps bouncing around. But L4 and L5 are um, equilibrium points. So anything that reaches those places will always stay there. So maybe that's where our museum orbit goes. And the Earth itself is a powerful attractor. It's a stable equilibrium point towards objects within that state of space always tend. So in the other image here, we have Mir, the Russian space station, the Soviet space station, excuse me, uh, with one of the space shuttles. And Mir deorbits in 2001, and some bits are still up in space, and some are in the bottom of the ocean, and some are for sale on eBay. You can think of it as uh, an artifact that has decayed, or you can think of it as a site that exists on a much larger scale than we're used to thinking of, right? So if we think of it as a Cartesian, Cartesian flat plane, it's an artifact that's broken up. But on one of these manifolds, it's actually at the bottom of a local attractor. So there are different ways of thinking about it. Um, but with space, this, this gravity is always something that you have to think about. And thinking about gravity, you have to think about relationships, attractors, and which things are attracting other things and how. It's always this, a site, an assemblage, never looks the same from one moment to the to, to the next, unless you take into account how it's interacting with gravity, is my understanding of, of all this. Which brings me to the International Space Station Archaeology Project. So if you click on the, the top link, that'll take you to the, the project webpage. The next print, uh, the next link is a preprint on methods of space archaeology that uh, um, Alice and, and Justin have put together. You know, there have been billions of dollars uh, spent building this space station. Um, Before too much longer, it is projected, it is planned to deorbit the space station and drop it into the sea. Alice and Justin's project is an attempt to understand this built environment in space, this human habitation, this off-world human society before that happens. And I always like talking with uh, Justin about this because you know part of his I, 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 fir I first met Justin in the context of virtual archaeology of, of human societies within game worlds um, we were both teaching with Minecraft so it's not so much a, of a, a step to see how that progression happens but he's also in California NASA's out there Jet Propulsion Laboratory, lots of the, the American infrastructure for, for space. And NASA put out a call for, for new astronauts. And of course, we all look at that thinking, oh, maybe this, is, maybe this is the time where it'll happen. And damned if NASA doesn't explicitly prohibit archaeologists from applying to be astronauts. They'll take chiropractors, but they won't take archaeologists. So... Justin um, gets talking with Alice and they start saying, you know what? We're going to show what the value is of archaeology to NASA. We're going to get them to change their mind. And so they, they start coming up with what is it we can do. There's my button here. Okay, so one of the first things that they do is they start thinking, okay, well, obviously we can go up to, to the space station. But NASA has been pretty good about sharing photographs taken inside the space station. So one of the first things that Alice and Justin and their team start thinking about is, okay, what can we do with these found photographs? You know, it's um, these glimpses of life inside the station. And one of the very first things they notice is this really interesting division um, 
between the different groups on the space station in how they inhabit that space, right? So this, um, in a sense, this is kind of like walking over a field and spotting things on the surface who, and, and, and picking up and, and, you know, studying that kind of large scale distribution, the connection to the actual spaces, um, harder for the archeologists to see because they haven't excavated yet, but there's patterns that are, that are meaningful. And the link here takes you to one of the articles based on this phase of, of the study. Um, the religious iconography from the Russian side is really fascinating. They, they demonstrate, Alice and Justin demonstrate this really fascinating imbrication of the Orthodox Church with uh, space and the construction of identity and finding that the 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 role once occupied by the Communist Party is in Soviet space is now being orchestrated by the Russian Orthodox Church in tandem with Roscosmos, the, the equivalent to NASA over there. So it's, it's really quite cool what they're able to spot just by checking out the, the found photography. But it would be good to be more systematic about it. So Justin's team is in investigating how computer vision and neural networks might be used to systematically go over all of this, uh, this photographic imagery. So if you take a neural network and you train it on pictures of, of dogs, for instance, it learns to recognize from any image, hey, this is, you showed a picture of a goat, it'll say, oh, that's probably 50% dog. And 30% something else. And so they've been they've been working on that. And the link at the bottom will take you to a really interesting talk that Justin has been uh, gave not that long ago about using computer image imaging and neural networks for that. This is where I start coming into the story because in my other research project, I'm looking at human remains that are bought and sold on social media. And I'm with Damien Huffer at Queensland University. And we're looking at them at scale, tens of thousands of photographs. And we're recognizing that these are probably the only photographs of a life lived. Um, the only documentary evidence for thousands of people, many of whom are, are going to be from indigenous groups or other um, groups without the power, because it's typically not white guys whose human remains end up being sold on social media. And so we're using computer vision in a very similar way. So we start comparing notes about how we can make that work. And, you know, Justin's project here with, the, with computer vision is looking to see if the machine can identify the way that spaces on the, on the space station are gendered or are constructed through various ethnic or national lenses or other patterns associated with the occupation of, of specific spaces. It's pretty cool. Uh, whoops, wrong button here. So this brings us to the Square uh, project. So there's a private company that manages the astronauts' time on the space station. Their time is just so micromanaged. And that private company said to Justin, there, there was an opening for experiments and did he and Alice have anything ready to go? And so they cooked up a, an experiment best based on the idea of the test pit, the sampling test pit, right? So you divide everything up by a grid of squares. I'm assuming everybody here is an archeologist, but maybe the people who will be watching this later on might not be. So. You divide your site up into a grid, you select individual squares to dig to, to get a sense of a sample of what's going on as the site as a whole. And traditionally, these tend to be one meter by one meter in size so that several can be excavated in a short period. So they proposed to, to NASA and to this private company that they would ask the astronauts to mark out one meter squares on surfaces throughout the space station, taking into account privacy of the astronauts and any national security implications. And instead of digging them, right, so starting at the end and working your way forward, they're kind of starting at 
the bottom and working their way up by taking uh, timed photographs every certain number of hours over two, three weeks on the station. So in a way, they're documenting site formation and, you know, layers of actions rather than working backwards. It's, it's a pretty cool idea. It's a really, the NASA and the, the private company almost laughed at how simple it was. And when you think of the cost of getting stuff up to the space station and escaping the Earth's gravity, well, an experiment like this only requires a couple of pieces of duct tape and the cameras that are already up there in space. So here we have Justin um, road testing a, a prototype of what was going to be. You've got the color calibration curve there. And um, there's a bit of distortion in the space station because of curvature of, of walls and so on. So uh, there's a, a photographer working with Justin to, to correct for that distortion, you know, kind of creating orth, orthorectified photos. Um, and then this is where, where I enter the, the story. And Justin says, so we, um, we only got a heads up. We have about two weeks to uh, get everything sorted out before it goes up on the next mission. Uh, we know what we want the astronauts to do. They're going to take these photos and those will be transferred back to us securely. Uh, how do we record this information? And this is me with my digital archaeology and digital humanities hat finally getting to do space archaeology. How do we record this? And should, I don't know. Um, I, as a graduate student, I was involved with the Tiber Valley Project, a uh, heavily database type powered project. And I, as a graduate student, managed to kill the Tiber Valley database and uh, destroy three months worth of work through some ill-considered interventions in the underlying code. So I wanted to redeem myself, but I also, I'm thinking, okay, so how, how do we record things? How do archeologists record things? What state of the art right now? And I start, I, I, I start, you know, jerry rigging something together and it becomes a bit of a Rube Goldberg machine. I, you know, I'm building stuff in Python with TK Inter and I'm building sheets and trying to basically translate a single context recording sheet uh, into the context of the space station. And it just doesn't work because the things I record, then, you know, there, there's stuff floating around. It might appear in one photograph, in one part of the station. It might appear in a different part of the station. A site on Earth doesn't really reconfigure itself um, underneath your feet as you go. So uh, it was a bit of a fail, this first attempt uh, on me. You know, What brings the site together on Earth, what holds it in position is gravity, right? But in space, gravity is weak and neither the space nor the things of the station would stay put. And that was the, the big problem that I, I was having. And, you know, we, we construct meaning through these relationships that stay put and the assemblage stays in a certain place and the relationships stay there. But we're talking, we're, this is anthro, Anthropocene archaeology. This is, you know, maybe what Peter Campbell recently described as a hyper object, right? Where you have objects of vast temporal and geographical scope, right? The space station is moving at ridiculous speeds around the planet the whole time. Um, so a hyper object is something that we cannot fully perceive but it's still a consequence of human action. So he, you know, he brings up things like climate change and radiation, but also radio waves, right? So uh, our earliest radio transmissions. So anyway, we can't, he goes on to say, you know, that we can't think of human residue as comprising spatially and temporally flat containers, um, what we would normally call an, an artifact. And I read that article and it, it's a really interesting article and I'm still wrestling with what it all might mean, but it did show me that the reason I was failing with my recording system was because I was still thinking in Cartesian coordinates. And seduced by the metaphor of the test pit, you know, the edges of the photo 
aren't the boundaries of the trench. They, they're, uh, uh, they're a pomerium. They're a sa- sacred boundary. They're, they're the auger sitting on top of the arcs of the Capitoline Hill with his hood around his head, drawing a magic square in space and interpreting the flight of birds as they pass through that, that one relational frame of reference. Um, I'm still thinking this through, right? So if this doesn't make sense that's okay because you know that's one of the reasons why i'm talking with you today because i'm expect maybe somebody will have some thoughts on that and it made me think of you know the things that are flowing through here and i i love the the fact that the word thing has this deeper germanic meaning of a gathering place of a, an assemblage coming together an agence amant. you know the the idea that there's always something dynamic about things and on the space station, then, okay, there's no absolute positioning. What matters is positioning with relationship to everything else. Um, things that go together can be really spatially distant, right? Objects can become clouds. Clouds can be an object. It's not something that we observe from a distance, but it's something we exist within and this is Peter Campbell talking, um, and a, a hyper object. And may, maybe the ISS is a hyper object in the way that Campbell is talking about. But I know, but I am certain though, that if gravity is the weak archeological force in space, Velcro is the strong archeological force because everything in that space station, if they want it to stay put, it's got to be Velcroed in place. And so every you know, there might be things that are just floating around, but everything else is a in, really intentional act. It's got to be put. There's a place for everything and everything in its place. And sometimes those places start to evolve and merge, and they're not really what, what NASA or the astronauts might first uh, have thought. NASA keeps a database of every single object that's ever gone up in, into the space station. And do you know they've lost stuff? There are things in the space station floating about that nobody's really sure where they are. And I, you know, that kind of feels like the setting for a horror flick or something, but anyway. So at this point, I brought in Chantal Brousseau, my, my wonderful graduate student in history and data science, who um, took a look at my jerry-rigged um, Rube Goldberg recording systems, and we we talked about relationality and, and so on. And she says, "Well, you know what? Um, taking into account the need for security and 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 these sorts of things, we could take the the image annotator from the VGG group at Oxford, can modify it for our purposes, have it on a you know secure server, and we can use that to start." drawing in every image the relationships between all of these different objects. And we work out that we can use a graph database rather than a relational database. Relational database, contrary to the the term, isn't actually all that good at relationships, especially ones that keep reconfiguring themselves the way that we have here on the space station. We can, in in a graph database, we can just add more edges and expand the data model as we go. And then when we are ready to analyze stuff, you know, this this screenshot here is from the Neo4j graph database. Could be this one we'll use, might be something else. But, you know, it's a fundamental network analysis approach to defining meaning and finding patterns. But another thing that we're exploring is the idea of taking these as statements of knowledge about what's going on in the space station pumping them through a neural network to to vectorize those statements of knowledge. So what's called a knowledge graph embedding model. And then we have this huge multidimensional space space that results from that. And we can measure uh, distances between ideas and use that to generate hypotheses um, about what's going on. So there's, we're not quite at that step yet so I can't really show you that there's been a lot of um I'm I am self-taught in terms of all things digital so I um 
have enjoyed a steep learning curve lately. Uh, but also another byproduct of this approach that Chantal and I have come up with is that we're also able to create training data for automatic image detection so that we'd be able to continue to do this work at a much uh, faster and more systematic approach. But part of the problem, and this which comes down to the expertise of the archaeologists, is you know the same object might appear in different test squares through the um, the space station, and there, there's always going to be these weird edge cases that require human intervention to um, to intervene with. So we're training an, an automatic archaeologist. We're, we're you know in the same way you would teach a, uh, an undergraduate student how to to spot different kinds of fabrics and wares as they first, I, I like to think that we're, we're teaching a machine to be um, as good as maybe an undergraduate, um, but I don't know, could be wrong on that one. Anyway, this is where we're at. Um, so, you know, Justin has put out a couple of pieces on the blog about what we're seeing. This is kind of the system in organ, in, in operation, um, all of these relationships will be expressed as edges within the in the graph, and he's able to, you know, he's starting to see the humanity of these astronauts in this tightly regimented society, starting to shine through in the ways different equipment is being used and adapted and improvisation happening. Um, it's really, really fascinating stuff, and I am, I am honored you know to to have been included in a little way in this and justin and alice recently won the award for outstanding work in digital archaeology from the uh, archaeological institute of america um which sort of you know it's it's a nice sometimes an award is a really nice validation of the work because there are still elements within the the funding landscape of archaeology in the United States that does not see any of this as archaeology and is, in fact, really obstructionist uh, about that. It says archaeology is only the thing that happens on Earth, and it's only something that happens in the context of really old stuff. You know, so, you know, what, contemporary archaeology is not an issue? Anyway, this more or less brings me to the end of my uh, my tale of um 10 year old sean getting to live out some of his um his aspirations and dreams and getting getting to to have a look on the inside of some really fascinating stuff and so i'd like to to just say again how much i appreciate um the work that justin walsh and alice gorman are doing and um that they've been able to, that Chantal, my student, has been able to play such an important role with their work and uh, for us to, to have had this opportunity. And I would love to hear what you all think, because Lord knows I'm not the expert here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. That's, um, it was really, um, I mean, as well as being a, a lot in there, it was really exciting. Um, and um, I, I found myself in a position of thinking there was there was even more archaeology than I expected in there, and also even more space than I expected in there somehow. Um, so um, very 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 cool presentation, um, and um, I'm 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 trying to think of all, all you know think past all my my sci-fi geek questions to um, to some actual digital humanities questions. But um, but in the meantime, if anyone else um, has anything they want to ask, feel free to. Either raise your hand or or just unmute and shout or type it in chat if you prefer. If you prefer that, please do um please do jump in. Um I um I might start off. I wonder if um I'm trying to visualize these these test squares that you um that you've got set up throughout the um throughout the ISS. And um and this is this is this is simultaneously a space geek question and a, and an archaeology question, but can you can you maybe give us an example of something that appears in one of these squares and then disappears again at a later phase? You know, that, that's not just sort of accumulating, but but moving in and out of the the squares. Um, because I, I'm, yeah, 
Yeah. So so right now, Alice and Justin are performing the annotations and, and working through all of the images. Um, there are things like, um, oh gosh, I don't even know what they're called, but they're, you know, when you, you stick your hands into, um, like there's, there's a, a chamber and you stick your hands through the gloves that are inside so you can work with that. There are portable. Is that called a Waldo or something? I don't know what they're called, um, but it's it's so that you you know it remains clean. There there are things like that which are portable, which which kind of are moved into different contexts. Um, there are some areas that are, are are food preparation areas and have um, bits and bobs there. That uh, I mean, if if people in space or anything like me in my own kitchen, I you know I end up using a butter knife as a screwdriver and, and, and different things. So there's there's kind of that domestic intrusion that this is me floating um, that that cuts across spaces and I'm sure I'm sure Alice and Justin have identified more but um this is just me uh, off the top of my head of of what we saw in some of the when we we tried to road test these systems that we're using so yeah so these really are spaces that their their function changes over over different yeah. times and so different things or different completely different things might just end up moved into them and yeah yeah, like there are spaces that are meant to be for this or that yeah. or the other thing, um, but um, and and the rules are set by the the people on Earth. But the people on Earth aren't up there in the space. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a sensorial archaeology to be done in the space station too. Like apparently it just reeks, uh, and there's um, uh, persistent sound that that must really wear you down over time um so how people carve out little spaces to be humans first and astronauts second um strikes me as a, a really interesting thing to to look into too especially when you have um uh people like um well pe you know people talking about all oh, longer space trips and, and all this sort of thing they there's always this tendency to focus on the engineering side of things, which obviously is quite important to the detriment of the human side. And it's always the human side that um, ends up being the thing that ultimately matters in how these, these systems work. I mean, if that's anything science fiction has taught us, it's that. But I mean, we know it from other kinds of similar situations on Earth. Like well, go ahead. Well, I mean, like there wasn't there that what was it called Biosphere One or something where they created these in these uh, habitation modules in Arizona and sent uh, seven or eight people in there to be, uh, you know, pretend astronauts in a in a space habitation, and it the social dimensions fell apart almost instantly, like pure. You know, it goes back to Golding and Lord of the Flies, right? But yeah, I, I think when when engineering is is put first, you know, they they need archaeologists, they need anthropologists if they're gonna if we're gonna do this right. Um, but try telling that to NASA. Is there any any um, work on sort of the anthropology of submarines that that may have some similar bearing? To that i mean they're a lot bigger of course yeah that's a really good question um and i don't know the answer to that but i mean i don't know go to google and see what it says but yeah no that's that's a really good question and would be appropriate right appropriate comparanda and and even a slightly slightly less intense but oil rigs and things like that places where people are yeah oil stuck, rigs stuck together um, the research stations in antarctica Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of which are, as you as you hinted earlier, perfect locations for horror movies, right? For exactly that reason, there's horror movies in, in all four of those locations you just you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, anybody else? Anybody else want to jump in? 
trying to keep my eye both on chat and screen. Maybe, Sean, if you remind us of the key um, questions that you were hoping for people's input on, that we could we could oh, turn, well, I, turn, turn know, the camera around. Yeah. I would be interested in hearing from people who, who work with graph databases about um, how the things that they found them to be especially good for, for um, things to watch out for, or, you know, things like dumbass, don't use a graph database, use X, Y, Z instead. I, I'm open to being wrong and to being uh, taught what a better approach might be. Um, and I mean, if anybody wants to email me afterwards with that too, that's, that's cool. Or um, I'm on Mastodon. I, I'm on uh, scholar.social. It's a lot to think about, right? It's, it's, there's so much that's going on here. Um, and I, I, that, that article by Peter Campbell about hyper objects and so on, um, there's so much to chew on in there that, that I think is applicable here, but I'm not entirely certain how yet. But that, that kind of work that, um, that, that's really thinking through the implications for how we do this thing we call archaeology, um, when there are these we create that just permeate our entire bodies or, or that we have to live within. Um, I, I, I think that's, that's going to be maybe one of the, the avenues for exploration that, that help with these questions. You know, especially people are, you know, the president has announced, you know, wanting to go back to the moon. The Chinese are trying to do that. Um, India, Saudi Arabia, different, you know, there's this new national bragging rights for getting out into space again seems it's it's hotting up as it were. And then then there's all the commercial stuff that's going on, which is ultimately it's about as commercial as do, except they get access to government money a lot easier than we do. Um, you know, SpaceX is government subsidized up the wazoo. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that was a, uh, a rant from, from a different side of things. Uh, mm -hmm. So Sarah mentions a uh, graph database using arches. I, I would love to learn more about that and find out from you later on how that, how that, Develops. I know um, Eric Kanza from Open Context is doing a lot of stuff in terms of arches and development of, of that. Um, I haven't played with arches much myself yet, so I would really love to hear more. Um, so please, yes, do do get in touch. It's Sean.Graham at Carlton.ca. Um, S H A W N. There's actually another Sean Graham at Carlton who spells his name S E A N. We sometimes get each other's email. You sometimes answer it. Don't, don't, don't answer that. <laughs> Only the interesting ones. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering. Um, so one of the one of the questions you raised that I was hoping people might might answer was about the um, the design of these test test pits, um, and I wondered. Um, I wondered if if um, if anyone was was maybe going to. To ask, and so instead, I'll I'll, I'll ask. I, I hate the concept of the devil's advocate, but I'll but I'll I'll sort of ask. Um, and if anyone else wants to to jump in on this, feel, feel free to. But is is there a sense in which the fact that, as you've said, these um, these squares are they're so fluid, they're um, they're they're high projects in this in this sense, and things things come and go. Does that um, is there a sense in which that makes it maybe a, a less appropriate metaphor for the test pit, and that maybe some other some other way of um, yeah. Of, of sampling the the the, the archaeology of the ISS might 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 need to be thought through because um, well, it feels well, like it ought to be when you say it's a square that's not moving, but then when you when you realise that it it, actually, it is moving because everything's moving. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, within the frame of reference of being inside the space station, it might be that I am simply overplaying 
the degree to which things might move from one place to another. I'm certain that they do. I'm certain that people move stuff around, but they also have to keep track of everything. Um, so Justin or Alice might might say that maybe I'm, I, I, I could well be wrong on that, you know, and, and perhaps put too much emphasis. Um, but yeah, when you step outside the space station and you think about the hyper object and, and, and everything moving around, I don't know what other metaphor they could have used though for this this experiment. And I mean, it is the first time archeological research has been done in space. Um, the astronauts took the photographs. They, um, they, they participated in the experiment following the protocols that Justin and, and Alice put down. The, the speed with which the experiment had to come together in order to meet launch windows and deadlines and all of the other hyper-managed uh, aspects of it. I, it, it. It's kind of a brilliant little experiment requiring nothing more than some duct tape and um, or painter's tape and, and, and a camera and a willingness of the astronauts to play along. So, yeah, I, I'm, not I, I'm not sure I know what the answer is to the question. Um, but I, I guess I guess the exponent one of the things this experiment will do is give that answer as to how yeah how meaningful they are and how much things move. I guess that's one of one of the questions you're you're looking for an answer to. Yeah. Well, and, and that's it, you know, that's another thing that's always been for me super cool about archaeology is this mm -hmm. DIY gonzo mm -hmm. approach to um how do we do this? How's this going to work? And and figuring it out. And mm -hmm. I I love that kind of stuff. Um and yeah, over time, methods and approaches become codified and we, we learn to teach them and we learn what works best with them. But then, then somebody goes and invents space archaeology or goes and invents a, a new, new field of, of understanding human duration, which is another reason why I really like Dan Hicks' formulation of that. Um, and we have to rethink everything we know. And I think that's healthy. I think you have to, because otherwise you you end up um, just replicating structures that might not be suitable and might actually cause damage. So, you know, for instance, with computer vision or AI and applying that to archaeological questions, realizing that the training data is just absolutely so critical, but even the ways that these technologies work simply exist to create new us versus them categorizations sometimes. Um, archaeologists have a lot to say to our contemporary world and we got to be out there doing it in weird places and invisible places to, to make that message heard because otherwise the, the, the stereotypes of archaeology are just so strong and that's partly because earlier generations of archaeologists were really good at, at playing the public relations game. Now, they had fewer channels that they had to deal with, too, right? Uh, what's his name? You know, Wheeler goes on animal, vegetable, mineral, and he reaches everybody in a country because there's only two channels on the television sort of thing, right? So we have a, a harder job, but space archaeology has a really strong story a really strong branding um, and public relations officers at universities and elsewhere are thirsty for stories that, that do this. And we, we, this is the game we're in, right? So we, we have to, to tell that. And I think part of the story that is really fascinating are these questions that like what you've raised, are, are these the appropriate ways? No, we don't know. Let's find out. Yeah, absolutely. I guess I guess what I sort of was was hoping for was um, sort of imagining that you know having done this experiment and it works in some ways and and less you know maybe less so in other ways. Um, what other ways might you imagine? You know, if you get to do this again, what other things might you do? And, and you, you can you can imagine other um, other ways of formulating that sort of for taking snapshots, right? You could say let's just take a picture of 
the space that surrounds this one object, wherever this object happens to be, and we'll follow the yeah. object around, or yeah. we'll follow a person around, or you could do rather than rather than using the um, the test dig as a as a metaphor, use GIS as a metaphor, and so track where a certain class of objects, which could be people or something else, moves yeah. around around the thing. I'm thinking of the way that um, Andrew Reinhardt did in his in his GIS in of computer games and, and things like that. So there's there's various different metaphors you could. Yeah, absolutely. Try yeah. Out. Um, and I'm sure you can think of many more than I can. Um, well, exactly. And Andrew Andrew had a similar problem when he was trying to understand human culture as expressed through some of these open world games and had to come up with a, a recording system that would work in a similarly hyper object of the space within that game. And I, li I like the idea of maybe following an astronaut and working through the, the things that that astronaut is experiencing or engaging with at certain time intervals, right? That reminds me, of, we were talking before the, the show started here uh, about Vince Gaffney and some of the experiments that he was doing in the 90s with wearable computing and that sort of total recording approach, or, or maybe following an object. And, you know, so the first person views of different kinds of actors in that space, both human and non-human, and then working at the, those, like that would be really cool. Maybe that's a follow-up experiment. Um, but yeah, we our archaeological metaphors only take us so far because they were developed in Cartesian space. But I really like that idea. Uh, that's a cool idea. Cool, thank you. Last chance for anyone else to jump in with questions or suggestions. Um, as I hope I've demonstrated, no question is too silly, no suggestion is too naive. Um, Not at all. We're just making stuff up as we go along, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm thinking of, um, of developing a class for my first year undergraduates on space archaeology. I, I think that would... Um, it would be fun to work through these problems with them because they're not aware of the limitations yet. They're, they haven't been disciplined into thinking in particular ways, which is what you know we're supposed to do in the university. So I, I think of space archaeology as perhaps being something that could undiscipline people into thinking more holistically about our place in the world. I don't know. Writing a course is a lot of work. I mean, it sounds like you've written about half of it already. Um, I just make things up one day at a time. Just got to be able to get it done before class meets on Wednesday. Yeah. That'd be fascinating. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not one of your undergraduates. I'd love to take that. Yeah. Um, well, you can zoom in. Okay, then um, maybe we should we should wrap it up there. Um, Thank you, thank you very much again. I'm sure everyone um, um, agrees this was um, this was probably both the most unusual and and also one of the most fascinating um, seminars we've had um, in the two years of this series. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, this would be the point where there would be a, a thunderous applause if we were in a real room. Um, so um, thank you, thank you very much. Well, th thank you everyone for your your time and attention on a you know a Tuesday evening where you are. It's been my pleasure.